for the proposed amendments to the Callas zoning. Um, I appreciate you all coming out and uh, sharing with us your thoughts. Um, I want to thank Orca for being here to record this meeting. Uh, Donna Fitch has graciously accepted to take notes so that he, we on the Planning Commission can um, listen uh, with our ears wide open. Um, <laughs> Annie Oakley had both eyes open, we got her both ears open. Um, the agenda, um, let's just start by introducing the Planning Commission. You want Hi, I'm Melanie Keene, I live in Adam, I've been on the Planning Commission for a few years. John McCullough, I live around Kent's Corner. And I'm Jan Olson, and missing is Gary Root, who um, normally uh, comes, sometimes a little late with some goodies, so we'll, we'll go ahead and still hope for that. Um, about the Planning Commission, uh, Melanie brings um, information relative to keep us relative to state statute. Um, Gary brings a perspective of uh, institutional history. He's been on the longest. Uh, John's um, specialty basically is the information that he provides us from years of being on zoning administrator and the issues that have come from that, as well as um, he does a lot of our map work, um, and I consider him our map guru. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to share with those of you who were not here before that how the Planning Commission works pretty much is um, by consensus. Um, we will, we, we do work on writing standards or writing um, these regulations. We have it up on this little thing up here. We work together on how, what is it that we want to say, how do we want to say it. Um, and so basically, you've got a consensus here as to what the language is. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention before we get going um, is the process of approving amendments to um, right for these regulations. We do have to meet state statute, and so this planning commission is required, um, and it has a, a, a warning, and with that warning was a set of, of language that was put out. Tonight, um, the opportunity is here for you all to comment on it, we, are, we will take notes. We've already heard some comments from a group of people. Um, after this meeting, the Planning Commission will meet, however long it takes, to restructure or rewrite some of this, if there is going to be a rewriting, um, which there probably undoubtedly will be. We must write notes documenting the changes that we made, those, uh, the new regulations will get printed, the notes will get printed, those will go to state, and then it goes to the select board. Now the select board has to have their own public hearing. Once the final, or what we dub final, goes to the select board, they have an opportunity to make changes, but they have to also let the planning commission know if it's of substance and any changes have to be made. If there's no changes made in substance, the Planning Commission, or the, the Select Board, then calls uh, for a public hearing. They have to follow the same warning procedure. It, everything has to go out to the abutting towns, and it has to follow through that procedure. Once the Planning, uh, the Select Board meets and approves uh, this language, then it goes to vote. Um, and then it, it will be called on a, on a ballot, and the whole town votes on it. So those are the processes uh, that we follow, that we'll be following um, to get this approved. Um, what we're gonna do tonight, uh, we've got a few PowerPoints to go through, possibly a few maps, uh, to kind of lay the groundwork of what, uh, what we've done. And, um, and then we're gonna open it up. And what I would like for each of you to do when you speak is give your name, where you live, and then make your comment. Um, kind of like town meeting, you know, uh, and so that we're, we can hear it and have it be distinct. 
Um, okay. Are you ready, John? John, by the way, did the oh, with the did the um, PowerPoint. Let me get it going. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're going to be talking about, we honed in first on some, on water quality. Um, and we decided in reviewing uh, maps and everything that we thought the Shoreland District, the way it is today, <coughs> provided or has several parcels that are quote unquote in shoreland, but actually have no shoreline. So there are several parcels that are in a shoreland district that are nowhere near the lake. Uh, and it's a matter of how that um, district is designed. Um, we also looked very closely at all, a lot of the current uh, cottages and current dwellings that are along the edges of the lake. Um, a lot of them are in the buffer. Many of the parcels are non-conforming. They don't meet the three acre standard of the Shoreland District at all. Um, so we have non-conforming lots and we probably have quite a few non-conforming buildings. Um, on looking at the dimensional standards of the Shoreland District and looking at the dimensional standards of the, um, and we're going to have a slide that will kind of go through that a little bit more, um, the looking at the dimensional standards of Shoreland and comparing it to the dimensional standards of rural residential, they are almost identical. And so our thought was, well, if we really want to concentrate on what happens around the lake, then maybe let's just have an overlay that absolutely concentrates on what there is around the lake and how it helps with the water quality. Um, the last thing to mention is that we've had quite a few uh, people who live on the lake area that um, voiced a concern of having totally different standards compared to the state. And so our goal also was to have more alignment with the state so that there wouldn't be as big a discrepancy with what the State Shoreland Protection Act was and what we had. The other thing that we have added um, is an erosion and uh, stormwater control measure, which is in section 3.15. In doing our research relative to buffers, what was, came across from us or to, to us from the state was the greatest importance was preventing erosion. Um, and so we have, in this, there is a whole new section on erosion uh, control and stormwater management that will apply to all districts, not just shoreline. On flood hazard and river corridor, um, the next big item, uh, which is marked or highlighted, um, river corridor, we're adding a whole new overlay. Now this is important for a variety of reasons. Um, there's this thing called an Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund. We call it ERAF. And when a federal disaster is called, the federal government provides assistance. And what happens is the state can also provide assistance, and they contribute anywhere up to 7.5%. The state could provide 12%, and the state goes up to providing 17.5%. So what happens is the, the town is responsible for providing less money with the more money that comes from the state. So it becomes a financial goal or a, a, an asset, if you will, to reach the 17.5% level. Calus is currently at 12%. When we add a river corridor overlay, we bring it up to 17.5%. And that's why we are adding the river corridor overlay. Not only for that, but also to protect the river corridor. And in that, there's no new development allowed in the river corridor. Um, and also, there's some stricter measures about what you can do in the river corridor. Um, in addition, and we'll show you that on some of the maps that come up, um, 
being part of River Corridor are streams that are what, 0.5 to 2.5 square foot in volume? What is miles. it? Miles. Huh? Square miles. Square miles, okay, whatever, in drainage as it goes down. Those are also considered River Corridor. Now they're, and we have to map them, and there's a 50 foot buffer on each side of that River Corridor. So it's, it's, a, it's actually um, almost, I think, as important in, in many ways as what there is uh, with the shrub. Um, okay, John, let's go on. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Historic district, we changed some things relative to the design advisory board. Uh, there's a new project registration form that we created that would be working, uh, would be useful um, for certain things in the design advisory board. A waiver, um, which is not as strenuous as getting a variance that the DRB can use, and, and also a whole new set of definitions. Um, we put all definitions in one chapter. The way our book reads now is you've got definitions in 5.4 and you've got definitions over in 3 point something else. So you dish, uh, definitions are kind of all over the place in the current regs. What we decided to do was to put all definitions in one section, separating out what was flood hazard definitions and keeping everything else. And we've added a lot of new definitions, which are highlighted in red. Okay, let's go. So shoreland, current shoreland district only involves <coughs> these um, lakes, Curtis, Ten uh, Ponds, Curtis Pond, Ten Pond, Nelson, Sabin, Bliss, and North Montclair. And these are 20 acre lakes, <coughs> so they don't meet really the state. With the shroud, with the overlay, we add um, Little Mud Pond, Adamant Pond, Hawkins Pond, and Soda Pond. Hawkins? Is that what the name is? But anyway, um, so those are 10 acre lakes. The biggest change is in this Adamant Lake. Uh, Adamant Pond currently is not in Shoreland, so when we, when we add Adamant, they become part of the Shoreland Overlay District, and in doing that, Sorry. Um, they, um, the folks in Adamant said they were willing to uh, reduce their village and have a higher, and have uh, rural residential. I guess that's all for that. So, let's look at what's existing right now. Right now, in the current um, shoreline, in your shoreline district, you have a 50-foot buffer. You have a 150-foot development. This buffer, it's a 50 it's a buffer of 50 feet vegetation buffer. Um, the setback is there, and you have an 800-foot total depth. Um, you have a three-acre minimum parcel size. There is no maximum clearing. There is a 10% maximum lot coverage in terms of impervious surface. That's the dimensions and what's in the shoreland protection district. Now, when you go to the overlay, the state has a 100 per foot, uh, foot vegetative buffer. So we're increasing the buffer by 50 feet. Um, the upland zone or of this is 150 feet, so you, it's kind of an expansion, if you will, from this 150 foot to a 250 foot over here. Um, so it's a 250 foot total depth. The parcel size is what the underlying district is. If the underlying district is rural residential, it's three acres, it's got the same setback. And by the way, both of these have a 300 foot, um, a 300 foot shoreline. What? What am I thinking about? Yeah, they have 300 feet of shoreline requirement. Um, and right now, we have the proposal is to have a 20% impervious surface in the overlay. Okay, go on. Another way of looking at this is to look at what it, look at Bliss Pond. Larry, is it familiar? 
So what you see here is this little tiny green is the 50 foot buffer. This is your 150 foot setback. Here's your 800 foot depth. And then there's all of this is three acres parcel size, but it could also be a three acre rural residential. No maximum clearing allowed and you have a 20% impervious surface. No, it's 10. We forgot to change ten. that. <laughs> it's 10. Sorry. It's all right. We're all human. The proposed shroud, this is a picture of the proposed shroud. So you've got your 100-foot vegetation buffer. The 150-foot setback goes to here. The parcel size is the base of what's underneath. Rural residential in this case. And in this, is the 40% clearing, maximum, and a 20% maximum impervious surface. So that's what we have um, relative to the shroud. We're calling it the shroud because Charlotte overlays. Yeah. Okay, where do we go from here? Uh, the next slide's a river corridor one. Okay, let's just go straight to river corridor. Or I could go to the, the PDF. Go to the PDF. Right. I think it's better. <laughs> Any place you want to look at? Oh, this is the PDF. Um, this is an overall graphic representation of our existing, right now, the, our existing zoning is here. And it looks pretty convoluted, but here's Curtis. Here's all of these um, non-conforming uh, parcels. You've got some big parcels over here. You've got... Um, <coughs> This parcel, like here, doesn't really have any shoreland, nor does this. Um, so you've got a lot of uh, people that don't have shoreland that are in shoreland. Um, can we get to, is there any other lake you want to show on this one? This is Curtis Pond, the way it exists now. Now, let's, let's do the proposed. So if we take this off. Now, this is what's proposed. So, here's our buffer. Here's our 150 foot limit. Now, on the east side, um, we have made it 800, uh, a 700 foot. Um, upland zone? Huh? Upland zone. Upland zone, yeah, sorry. Uh, and um, uh, at the request of, of some of the people from Lakes and Streams and Conservation. So um, we could also take this, go to Adamant. Can you show Adamant? Okay. Yeah, I just want to do something real quick. Um, the, uh, uh, there you go. You can see here that when we took Shoreland out, instead of having the village, which is the yellow, move in, um, rural residential wraps around Curtis. The only place village comes close is at the southern end. But, so this area here is... Uh, so this hatch mark, this is rural residential, keeping with the three acres. Here's your village. So you've got some parcels that are both village and rural residential. But you go down here where everything is village. This is the southern end, and the water flows down that way. And so even though, yeah, there is some, we want to protect here, but this, this is the village center where, where it is. John, can you show farther north on the pond by Jim? Whoops, sorry. Maybe, maybe I can. how to use this mouse. Almost would be easier than the internet. Well, if I set it so that I can scroll and zoom, then panning becomes a problem. Yeah. So the northern part is here of the lake. So we still have your three acre minimum rural residential, and you've got um, your 100 foot buffer and your um, 200. 150 foot overlay, up low. So that's the northern end. It, it's 
So what you're saying, the purple, there, there is no development in, or I, I'm not quite sure what to be done. It has a tighter impervious surface standard than the underlying district. There are a couple of uses that are a little different, not much. Um, uh, you got the three acre minimum, in, uh, which is the more stringent lot size standard. Um, but that shoreland district had the three acre minimum anyway, so, so that's really not a, that's not a change. Um, so it's, uh, I'd be hard pressed to say what the, uh, what the difference is between this and what we have now, except for the 100 foot vegetative buffer. Um, does anybody else want to see the adamant or any of the other lakes in the area and how it's affected? Or are you, are you okay with moving on? Adamant did have some very unique things that we're proposing. They had their original um, village up here. <laughs> that village used to go all the way up yeah. to the quarry. And then after meeting with them, they were willing to move their village down to here and make everything rural residential around it. Um, again, uh, the village is here. The designated village center is there. So we are keeping village with village. And again, the water flow. Um, <laughs> If in looking at all of this was the water flow mostly goes out this way. Sodom Pond was added. So all of those issues around Sodom Pond has been added. A question um Mars me. Um, rural residential that just means you have to have three acres. Is that kind of what it is? I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, three acre minimum it's rural residential. Acre. That's kind of like differentiates it from like the village. Oh, village, village, yeah. no village has unlimited, they don't have any acreage requirement. Okay. Rural residential has a three acre minimum. And the, the whole point of it from the state planning perspective is with your village is where you want your concentrated um, economic development. Um, and so when um, you apply for some grants and you are in the village district and you happen to be also a nonprofit um, and you can get grants. You, this, is, this is where the, the center of development is um, in the county. At, uh, at number 10 Pond, the, uh, when we take Shoreland out, the district that moves in to take its place is you can see the yellow area that is village and it goes all the way to the point where Memorial Hall right. is. Um, this was a request from the people in North Callis because they were going for some stuff, uh, village center designation um, and they wanted the village district to go to actually go up and have the hall in the zoned village district. Um, I think so it also became the village district for the North Callis area. But the more stringent requirements would apply as far as in environmental stuff, so they still have the shoreland district, the, the vegetative buffer, and, the, uh, and the, the space with limited development and clearing. Okay. So that's about it for the shoreland. Um, I'm going to like, we'll look at River Quarter, uh, seeing those, some of those maps. And then we're going to let you talk. I, I think what I wanted to do was share with you uh, some of the things that the Planning Commission has to look at in, in looking at the town and the entire town uh, relative to economic development, um, where you want that development, and yet how do you keep and protect um, the topography um, and the water quality that we have, which is immense in the town of, of, um, of Calus. Um, the rear quarter, I don't know how well you can see this, but all of these gold lines are river corridor. So you can see river corridor comes all the way around and around through here. Now, river corridor automatically has 
a 50 foot buffer on each side and and this is the, an, an idea or a drawing of what a river <coughs> corridor has. It has to follow the meandering of the river and, and it has this on um, around each side so that it just automatically is, is 50 feet on each side. Um, reduces the bank erosion, slows the flow, um, and um, tries to keep it in a straightened channel. Can you go back to the map again? Now, these little red things here, this is the 0.5 to 2.5 square mile streams that are also part of River Corridor. And those also have a 50 foot um, buffer, meaning no development in those 50 feet. What we have proposed, though, is that 35 feet of that 50 feet is to be vegetated, right? Did I get that right? That uh, will be vegetated buffer. And therein starts some of the discussion about mowing up to the 35 foot mark. Um, so that's just a very brief map of, of River Quarter, and I think it shows you the extent of everything that is there and how it affects all of Calus. It's not just around the lakes. Our, what we have with River Corridor um, affects much more in the land. Uh, is there anything else that we have? I can't remember. I wonder what happened to my uh, map. <laughs> do we have another slide or were we done? No, that's it for slides. Okay, and do we have any other maps? Or we can be ready to have maps if there's some questions. There's this. I mean, the river corridor stuff is all available to see on the, uh, the web town uh, interactive web map, which is what you see on your screen. Oops. No, we don't have the interactive map yet. Yeah. All right. So now we're here, and we've got our ears open, and we'll take notes. And you, if you have something to say, it is being recorded. Um, state your name, where you live, and either you have questions or have comments. I just wanted to ask about um, existing structures. That's all grandfathered, I'm assuming. But, you know, you said we there are nine conforming. I just hope if you could speak to the existing structures. Um, existing structures in River Corridor or in the Shroud? I, I mean, on the shoreline. On the shoreline. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question, so it's. I just wanted to speak. That if you like, can we compare items, sheds, or something that are on the shoreline? Is that grandfather? Or do we? Do you care about that? Uh, do you understand the question? I still am not getting it. Well, I think I do. Um, right now, the minimum standard for new development, if you're within the within 100 feet of the water, um, there's no new development. Um, if you go all the way to the edge of Shrod, 250 feet from the water's edge, we are uh, we're still having a conversation sort of about what should be allowed. Um, it had been that had been considered that an addition on the on the back of a building away from the pond didn't increase the level of noncompliance. But we've heard a lot that says any new impervious surface is uh, is something that has to be controlled. So there there are some folks who'd like to see no expansions of existing noncompliant structures if they're within the uh, the proposed shrine. Uh, and for sure in the buffer, uh, um, the non-compliant, it has to stay within the footprint and you can't enlarge. I mean, theory, that's what we're thinking about. So, um, you know, and for sure you, there's also a non-compliant standard that's not part of the shrine that the DRB has to look at. And that non-compliance, you can't make it larger. Um, so, 
it, the people that are, have their dwellings and their cottages that are in the buffer, um, uh, both the shoreland and also people that have dwellings that are already in the river corridor. Um, there's, there's, there's definitely, it, it's going to affect those people living in those dwellings. As far as not making a mark or any closer to the shoreline in the current draft. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But look that over and let us have your comments on it. Thanks. But putting a new roof on an existing thing is not. She's right. talking about maintaining, I think. You can maintain. Okay. You can, oh, sure. And you can repair. The, the regulation really is intended to curtail uh, an increase in impervious surface. Yeah. So anything that you do to, that maintains it is it's fine. Is fine. That's, that's permitted. But um, anything that would, that would um, increase the exposure uh, of impervious surface ha has to be reviewed in a, in a way that will decrease its impact on uh, on this close by waters. And by the way, this is Gary Root, the fourth member of the Planning Commission. <laughs> sorry I was late. <laughs> I'm particularly sorry I didn't bring any cookies. Uh, please. Oh. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, normally Gary brings the sweet stuff to keep well, us going. Running late and I came straight here. So. Yeah, that's awesome. We'd rather have you here. <laughs> no. Okay. No sugar is allowed. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to? Um, Sarah. Sarah. Sarah Gallagher. Um, I live on the north, uh, Random Road, north side of Curtis Pond. Um, and my concern is uh, the rain depths of proposed palace regulations. The deleted exemption for extraction of materials associated with agricultural or forestry <laughs> operations. Our, our land uh, is undeveloped on the north end of Curtis Pond, and we can afford to do that because it's in a land use forestry management plan. And so uh, we're concerned if you're going to make it so that we can't follow the forestry plan. Oh. That we need to follow in order to keep that, the land use. That That's, exemption was part of um, what section was that? Four point four. Four point four, uh, and it's our it's the section that relates to um, overall extraction. The reason <laughs> the reason why we got rid of that exemption was because uh, of what happened north on north on fourteen where a farm purchased the pro property and has totally denuded the property by saying that it was for his agricultural purposes. Well, maybe it was, but um, there are certain things there that I, it, it was, the former DRB chair was pretty upset by it because they could not do anything because of that exemption. Now, as a town, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get, but the farm isn't there. They specifically purchased this land. It's an empty land. They are not farming that land. If they were, it might be different. They trucked that sand all the way down to their farm. And um, I am a little sensitive to it because they did the same thing with the property across from where I live. Um, that property was given two times they could excavate 3,500 something or another cubic feet of sand per year for two years only. They were supposed to regrow it or redo something with it, and they have never done it. So we just have this thing with a bunch of sand and trees falling. So I think that's one reason, <laughs> a little bit personal maybe, and I don't mean to be personal about that, but. That was the reason for the exemption. It's okay. So it's. I mean, I understand that uh, something unfortunate occurred, but we may not be the only people who have. You know, it's also possible to responsibly manage forests right. and not damage the environment. And so you can't make 
a town-wide regulation based on a, a one bad actor, essentially, is I guess the Well, forestry is silviculture I mean, anyway. But forest, forest and silviculture and regular agriculture are exempted. What's going on with that was we said you cannot excavate. You can't, you can't get, uh, the, the issue is the excavation of the so sand. you're saying, <clears throat> when you're saying agriculture and forest, you're actually meaning mining, mining. Yeah, it's in the excavation so it should, section. It should say mining then instead of forest use. I don't know if it says forestry. I, I mean, it's... We'll anyway, look at it. anyway, the same yeah. 250 feet, which would be the, the Shroud overlay, um, that is also the State Shoreline Protection Act. And I'm not sure how the state, the state says that the town has to exempt certain ag and silviculture practices. And forestry I, in accordance with the forest management. Uh, yes, exactly. Exempt under the exactly. exactly. All right. As long yes. as it meets certain um, conditions. Okay, here the, here the state approved forest management yeah. plan. Yeah. Yes. You, you should be allowed to, I mean, yeah, yeah, I should agree. be exempted. No, I agree. It I, is. I it do is not exempted. know how the State oh, Shoreline Protection Act relates like to that, though. The, the State Shoreline Protection Act probably wouldn't allow cutting within 100 feet of the water. Great, that's fine, but <clears throat> Maybe it's, water. it's not bigger than that. Yeah. As long as it's not interfering with our ability to. And then the the two hundred, the remaining one hundred and fifty from that, from the vegetative buffer to the extent of the shrot, that's forty percent. Then, then from two hundred and fifty up, clear cut it. Really, I mean, it's raw residential, and you can, you but, can just no, it, there's no maximum. Right, but you're in current use, so therefore. Right. You know, you're following the principles of forest, silver right. management, and agriculture, so you're protected. But but the shred that we're proposing isn't isn't increasing. Uh, uh, so how close to the shoreline can we cut a tree down? No closer than 100 feet. After that, uh -huh. you you just can't, unless it, unless it's unless it's on its way out. Then there's there's all these standards about how to identify a dead and down tree. And, uh, yeah. What about road building? No roads. Well, sometimes you have to get in. Oh, like a logging road? Yeah. God, I suppose if you followed the, uh, the silviculture standards. Again, I would talk to the state about that. Right. Both, the, both the town rigs and the state are going are gonna to remain in effect. People are going to have to get permits for both. You're going to have to get a permit from the State Shell and Protection Act folks. And uh, you're gonna have to get one from the town. Until at some point the state delegates responsibility for the, to the town to manage the State Shoreline Protection Act. But I don't see that happening. Only a couple of towns in the whole state have gotten that, been delegated that responsibility. The state's not giving it up. Anybody else? Bill, Bill? Yeah. Right up the road. Um, what about um, where you have open land on the on a lake or on, on a river uh, that, you, that you mow or whatever? And that's gonna, you can still be able to do that. <clears throat> uh, I think on the shoreland, there's mowing of lawns. Yes. <laughs> And then there's, on the stream levels, in 3.1, whatever it is, we talk about brush hogging and mowing, you know, that goes up to a stream. So um, I think uh, what we have currently proposed, help me out here, uh, was that uh, mowing. Were you talking about a stream or a pond, or you want to know about both? Both. Okay. Uh, I think what we have for the... Where would I find that? Okay, Shoreland is going to be in uh, section, what is that, table 2.4? 2.4 and... Bill, I'll send it to you. Okay. And uh, it's... Um, G8. 
Lawns within the Shoreland buffer zone legally in existence on January 3rd, 2005. That's the current date or current zoning. Mm -hmm. Which are mowed at least once every two years may be maintained if no new development takes place. This is in the current draft. However, the area mowed shall not be expanded into the buffer and failure to mow at least once every two years shall mean that the provisions of this section apply, the thou shalt not mow general rule, um, apply, and the area may no longer be mowed. We also have had comments to phase that out. So those are, it's good to get input about what people want for the town. Yeah, I remember a meeting, was it a year or two ago? Three years ago, they were this country. And um, somebody, they wanted it for one year. And I said, well, that doesn't work if you're away for a year. And people don't come up to their camp, so. We heard that. Yeah, and I thank you for putting it in. Now, on the. On and take, to take that right away from people is, 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 a, is a real thing. So, I would not be in favor of that. Okay. And then the mowing for the um, under 3.14. I don't, I don't have what we changed it to, but the uh, we, we no longer call it grandfathering. We call it pre-existing. <laughs> I don't think it was ever called that in the zoning, but it's like a nickname for it that yeah. can be offensive. All right, so, so now we're shifting to the buffers and requirements of 3.14 A or B. Buffer requirements, exceptions, so the general rule, except as provided below, any new development shall be prohibited in buffers as established in accordance with this section. And this is the section that talks about riparian buffers, 35 feet on each side, wetland buffers, like any surface water buffer that's not a lake or a pond or shoreland. So it's your, um, this includes new mowing, clearing, filling, grading, or storage of material. So general rule is you can't do it. Scrolling down to B3, uh, pre-existing mowing. Oh, shoot, excuse me. Um, a landowner who has mowed in a buffer of surface water other than wetlands, because we can't touch wetlands, that's a state thing. Um, other than wetlands within, and it has two crossed out and five filled in. Is that what we were proposing, I guess? Mm -hmm. uh, of the effective date of these regulations, January, 1, 2015, I guess that's when the, the surface water buffers were adopted, may continue to mow the same area following adoption of this bylaw. However, the area mowed shall not be expanded, and failure to mow at least once every five years shall mean that the provisions of this section apply and the area may no longer be mowed. That's what we have in our current draft. Right. Um, I guess why wouldn't they both be the same? Isn't water water? Okay. I mean, five days of both. Well, it could be the same for two years. We were really trying to to address in in the one case we were trying to address lawns, mm -hmm. and in the other case we were trying to address fields. And um, one of the things that we discussed is that. Uh, what we, I mean, for people who want to maintain a field and not and not lose their view, we really would prefer that they mow less rather than more. Right. You yeah. brush out every five years versus every year. And um, you know, if somebody if somebody wants to send a tractor out there and brush hog it once every five years so that they maintain their we view, we're going to change it to two. We have it at five what's going now. Be left okay. behind and we went is, back to five. Uh, much better. As a, as a water protective buffer than if it's mowed like a lawn. Yeah. I agree. So yeah. that's, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you jumble those two things together and still have them make sense? And that's, yeah. that's really and what we're Our saying. current regulations call for five years. And when we were doing this, at first we thought, well, let's let's do to two years, and then we realized, well, yeah, but you don't want to promote mowing every two years, so we went back to five years. <laughs> sure. So. And then the other issue is, is it's also bad for water quality to mow. So at some point, do we phase that out? Do we 
you know, like at what point do we, the point of a pre-existing provision is to prevent unfairness of surprising new regulations on people who didn't know they were coming. And these have been around a lot. So we've been hearing from others uh, that maybe we just phase that out after a few years. So it's good to get input on all sides on these issues and figure out what's best for the town. Anything else? Anybody else? Yeah, if everybody else has had their, had their say, maybe I can go for it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Larry Bush. I live on Bliss Pond. <coughs> I'm um, the vice chair of the Conservation Commission in Calais. The chair is Stephanie Kaplan, and she couldn't be here tonight and apologizes for that. The other members of the Commission currently are Julie Hand, Neil Maker, Mark Brown, and Tracy Coolidge. Um, we've given the um, Planning Commission tonight, today, um, a set of comments about the shoreland zoning provisions in this overall package. It doesn't address the, uh, <clears throat> the flood hazard or the erosion sections. Um, there are copies, there may still be copies up here on that table. Um, I didn't know how many to bring, so the uh, comments will also be put online, at the, probably at the Conservation Commission's page uh, on the town website. Uh, that will take a couple of days. Um, a few comments. I would like to, to make this short rather than going through these, our document has 15 numbered paragraphs of, spe of specific comments, and I'd like to avoid that. Um, if, if the understanding is that this is submitted to the Planning Commission and will be taken into account in the same way as if it were read verbatim, I, would, I think we would all prefer that not, let it not happen. That, that sounds reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. Do members of the Planning Commission object to that? Yeah, no. Sense, but, yeah. Okay, I'll just make a, a couple of, of points about these, these, these 15 paragraphs. First of all, we have a, a friendly disagreement with the planning commission, and we think that uh, it could, should continue to be a shoreland district. Um, there's, there's potential for confusion and um, difficulties with inconsistencies between the underlying district and the shoreland district. Um, beyond that, it's kind of a philosophical question. We think shorelands are very important um, natural environments, that, and there has been a, uh, a shoreland a district, a full district, and we think it should stay. Um, we also believe that the shoreland district, uh, which is, is now a maximum of 800 feet under the state law and in the proposal of the Planning Commission, that would go to 250 feet which is the 100-foot buffer that everyone now agrees on, and then the extra space behind that. But the uh, Conservation <coughs> Commission is, is, is urging that the standard be um, 500 feet instead of 800 feet because there is um, some pretty good scientific indications that 500 feet uh, is not only a, a depth that will protect a lot of the wildlife that live on the, uh, the edges of the ponds, but even more importantly, perhaps in many ways, because of our obligation <clears throat> both to the town and to the state to maintain water quality, the 500 foot um, depth um, permits the best form of filtration and protection. And if, if you're interested, this is a document on the back of our proposals, which is an attachment to it. It was prepared by the state, and it's called the Lips of Sure, lakeshore vegetation for lake protection, and it has a list of things and how how much land away from the pond needs to be undisturbed in order to provide the, the protection for mammals, birds, and so forth, but also for um, water quality standards like uh, nutrient removal and sediment <coughs> filtration. This also will be on our on the website with our proposals. Who prepared this? Um, it was done by the, hold on a second, um, 
Yeah, I didn't see who had done it either. It's the it's the uh, A and R, and I believe they. Vermont A and R. Pardon? Yes. Yeah, I, it, I think it's on here somewhere. I'm just not seeing it. Yeah. But it, it's it's done by the state. Uh, it's it's available on their it's website. On the on the DEC Vermont website. Yeah. DEC is. Department of Environmental Conservation, which is part of A and R. Little thing under. It. <laughs> okay, so there are those two points. We urge that it remain a district. We urge that the um, that, that the, the width of it be a 500 feet rather than the current 800 or the proposed 250. Um, <clears throat> there was a little discussion earlier about the. Um, interplay between the state regulatory process and the town regulatory process. Um, we we urge very strongly that it be clear in the in the in the current in the proposed or in any new re uh, zoning regulations <clears throat> that both the Vermont Shoreland Protection Act and the Calus zoning regulations apply, um, and the <clears throat> regulatory and review process. Uh, at both levels be maintained. Um, why is that important? Well, for one thing, um, the, the state standards <clears throat> and the town standards uh, will likely diverge on a number of points. Um, and the state doesn't care what the town's standards are if, if ours are stricter. So the only enforcement mechanism that we currently have is through the zoning administrator and the DRB, and we're proposing that that level um, stay. Um, so there's the substantive differences that um, argue for they're maintaining the existing callous level supervision and regulation. There's also, um, and this is not something I think a whole lot of people think about a lot, but um, it's very important that the public know about things that happen in environmentally sensitive areas. Um, the state process doesn't really permit the kind of public um, notice that the town's process permits. Under the state's um, Shoreland Protection Act regulatory system, someone who wants to, to develop within the shoreland makes an application to an office um, at the state. Um, the, only, the only notice to the rest of the world that anything is happening at that point and thereafter is um, the applicant is supposed to file a copy of the application also with the town clerk. But there's no requirement that the town clerk post it or otherwise notify the public about the existence of this application. Um, is the, the, the standard says that the town clerk can post it in the town office if it chooses to, is basically the guidance that the state gives on that. So then the state has this, and there's a 30-day 30 30 period of time when it's, it's sort of like a notice period. And the state is supposed to have a website that you could go to if you were interested in seeing what permits were out there. Uh, and it would keep this on that website for, for 30 days. The, the problem at the moment, well, the problem could be that I just can't operate a computer, but I'm relatively uh, proficient. And I have tried and tried and tried to find on the state system where those permits are located. And the only place I found it, the, the, the page wasn't operative you couldn't actually find any of the permits on it. And that's unlike the permitting system for wastewater and various other things that the state regulates. So I don't know what's up there. I haven't talked to the state people about this. But the, the idea that the, that the general public has noticed of what's going on is, in our judgment, illusory. Because the final, only other requirement is that if you get the state's permit, you are required to put it of record uh, in, the, in the town. After it's all said and done, you have to put it there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, Larry, 
um, my understanding is when the applicant goes to the state, the state does what it is they do, but that applicant also has to go to the permit to the zoning administrator who has to verify whatever the state does. And that's not changing in these regs. Nothing like that is changing. Everything, so even though I can't see it on the state website, the fact that it's going to John and it's been approved or whatever, and then whatever, or any future zoning administrator, <laughs> it's still going to go to the Cala zoning administrator for a permit. Right, but the problem, the problem is that um, the way that these regulations are currently drafted, and I don't know if you have plans, um, a number of, of things have, have been included which make it clear to anybody who's given a, a fair reading that for, for many, many subjects, um, if you get a state permit, that's it. You don't have to comply with anything in the No, that is untrue. Yes. No, it's, it's, well, let me read. Would you the like the read current draft, we know? understood that, and you gave that to us already before, yes. and we said that we would be, count, would be looking into it. Okay. So I'm, that's all I'm going to say now, right now. And could I just have that? I understand, but we have, all that we can react to is what's legally, I think, is the written document that was posted with your warning. And I understand that you guys yes. are making changes in it, but, but those aren't formal. We, we can't respond to any changes you might make in this document. I understand you're telling me that, that, that things that might change and therefore things in our document okay. might Mel not Melanie. No, I appreciate that, and, and I think it's good for everybody to hear the concerns to the document we're all looking at tonight, and that's spot on. I did want to just point out the Environmental Notice Bulletin page on ANR's website has all of the Environmental Notice Bulletin, it's called. You can sign up for an email, which you're not going to want because you're going to get it every week with everybody's permits. But if you just want to go in and scroll, you can type in Callus, it'll pull up every type. Or you can type in Shoreline, I can show it to you later. Okay, okay. I'd like to see that. But, I did find that a page that yep. had other permits yep. that, that the A&R monitors, a whole page full of them. And I looked at some of the Callus ones. But there was, but Shoreland was not on that page that I okay. found. Oh, I'll show you later. Oh. Uh, Bill, do you have a question for Larry? Or no, I said something else to say. Oh, okay. Uh, so, okay. We'll let Larry finish. And then I know you want to be next. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, just here's, here's a, one example. I'll give one of, of a number. <laughs> Let's beat it to death. Um, in the Shoreland Buffer Zone Standards, which are um, 2.4, G. Um, the, the proposed language says that um, development within the buffer zone shall be conducted in compliance with the Vermont Shoreland Protection Permit or approval. Then the second <coughs> sentence reply, applies to uh, property um, which is um, on the other side of a road. Hmm. The, the, the significance of that is under the state's standards in the state statute, all of the shoreland regulatory provisions that otherwise would apply do not apply if there's a public road that, um, that s separates the pond on one side from the balance of the, what would otherwise be the shoreland um, coverage area, the shoreland zone. So I live on Bliss Pond, for instance. Everybody knows the whole south side of that pond. Um, has a road along it, and the road is probably the biggest contributor to the eutrophication that we're seeing where it's becoming a big lily pond. <clears throat> but my point is, the road is maybe 25 feet off the pond, it's another 30 feet wide. Some of the good folks who live on the other side of the road are within the 100 foot buffer zone, except that the state law says, no, nope, you're home free. There is no buffer zone because the road is there. Now, one of the wonderful things that, that the Planning Commission is doing, and, and we heartily applaud, them, is getting rid of that anomaly. So public roads won't be a barrier to enforcement of environmental regulations that affect the quality of the, of the water in the pond. So basically, what, what this says is there's two situations in this particular provision. One is 
um, land that's within the state's jurisdiction, that is not, on, not across the road, and if all of your land or part of your land is in that, then what this says is that it's conducted in compliance with a shoreland, a Vermont Shoreland Protection Act permit or approval, period. It goes on to say if the applicant has property for which a portion of the shoreland overlay area extends beyond the road, the standards listed below shall apply. And there is a list of you know, very good standards. Our proposal is that that list of standards apply across the board, but the point here is a fair reading of this says if you've got something that, that requires a state permit, um, and you get the state permit, then there's no role for the town. I mean, that's what it says right now. Um, but if you have land that's not covered by the state law and not subject to a state permit, which this new land, which would be on the other side of the roads are, then all of a sudden there's this very robust list of standards. And, and there are a number of places in this, which I hope will, will be, you know, are being dealt with, that, that make that point over and over again. And there's language that's taken out of the existing standards that makes that point. I can't understand why it was taken out unless, you know, I'm, I, I just yeah. don't say. I guess no, we're, we're trying I guess to funny. dovetail the state permit system with the, with the town, and you're right. Well, the problem with dovetailing it is that you're replacing yep. the state level regulation and oversight with, with just, I mean, the town level with the state's level. That's the effect of this language in so many places. Thank you for pointing this out to us. And your, your comments, uh, are specific in where they point yes. to that. Yes. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. That certainly was not our intention, and okay. um, and, and I appreciate your uh, uh, helping us to focus in on those places. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate you looking at that. If you find any errors or or problems with it, you know, I'd be grateful if you let us let us know. Okay. Um, Well, you know, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of this. We, we have um, provisions on, on, on what should happen if, if the overlay district is, if that concept is, is maintained and the, the idea of a, a, a full district is rejected. Um, we have comments on, on how changes shouldn't be made to the underlying districts um, if it's determined, unless it's determined that they won't have an adverse effect on the shoreland zoning provisions and the zoning regulations. Um, Can you give an example? Uh, yes. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure if this applies because I'm not sure now where your your draft is on a requirement, a minimum lot size requirement for um, the development. Um, but but there, it's my understanding there is no minimum lot size in village districts. And frankly, the, the only serious concern here probably is in the various village districts, Adamant, uh, North Callis, um, a little bit of Curtis Pond, um, which, uh, which, which can be very confusing and difficult to deal with if you've got very strict um, shoreland requirements and you've got under that overlay of district where there's a very strong policy drive, as there should be in a village district, to concentrating development, concentrating buildings. But our concern is that that latter policy and drive could, could potentially undermine the equally, if not in the minds of many of us, the more important concern about maintaining the environmental quality as best we can. Now, all of this recognizes that existing uh, non-conforming structures aren't really bothered here. What we're, what we're talking about in almost all cases are making changes in those structures that increase the impervious surface or entirely new development that wasn't there um, and would not be in compliance with these, with these standards. Okay, so Larry, if, if I can just uh, address that for a second. Um, we, we actually looked lot by lot at, um, at all of the 
uh, all of the places where changes were going to be made as a result of these new regulations. And um, the, the places, for instance, North, uh, the uh, North Calais uh, Village right now, the lot that it, there is a lot that uh, comes under the heading of just what you're describing that is now part of a village district and is also uh, drains into the into the pond. Is that Memorial Hall? That's Memorial Hall, and that's the and that is uh, and that is nearly the only lot in town that will that will change and become less regulated as a result of these regulation changes. Um, in other cases, the, the uh, for instance, North, Mon North, Mon uh, North Calais uh, Village, almost all of it is below the, is below the uh, surface of the pond, mean water level of the pond, and so it, they, they are still um, controlled by the, um, by the waterway, by the stream, uh, regulations, but they're below the surface of the pond and within existing uh, regulations, they in theory could apply for uh, a variance as a result of that drainage pattern, e even with our current and existing stuff. What, what, um, what really is happening is that because we're increasing the number of ponds, we're also increasing the number of properties that um, that are that affect a waterway, and so we're a actually adding restrictive regulations to those properties rather than because it, right now they don't there are none, and there are a bunch of ponds in town for which that's the case. Right. We so there are you know the the um, there's no uh, there's no um, uh, regulations around. Well, I'm not going to. The the big one, of course, is Adamant. That it's not currently. It's not in a shoreland district, right. and we're we're trying to add. So we're at, actually adding regulations to uh, that pond and Sodom Pond that that uh, currently don't exist. So yes, there are properties that are on those ponds that are upstream of, particularly of Sodom Pond. All of the, all of those properties are upstream of Sodom Pond. But right now they're not being regulated, so we're adding regulations mm -hmm. to those things. Um, right, and, and we so, appreciate that and support it. So, with the with the exception of Memorial Hall, really, it, we're looking at a net increase in stringency um, all all across the town, um, with with by changing it to an overlay instead of. Right, our concern is at yeah. this point is is with future changes, not not really what you guys are doing uh -huh. with this overlay, but just because there's an overlay in an underlying district, it's conceivably possible to make changes in the underlying district that either aren't addressed in the shoreland overlay or otherwise, if there isn't otherwise, um, would be applicable that are different than they are today that could hypothetical. You know, that's, that's true with every every aspect of these regs. Yeah. Well, it's true that regulation. Yeah, I mean, right. any, but any, you need to coordinate the two. Is our point. But any future is to go through the same process that we're doing tonight. Any right. future change of any of that is going to go through a, an iteration and a review. And believe you me, this person is not going to be young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, very quickly, we're proposing that the uh, existing shoreland district dimensional standards um, that are in the law currently be maintained. Um, there would be, of, of course, no clear cutting in the vegetative buffer zone other than what the, the, the state law, I believe, permits a hundred square foot cleared area or a maximum six foot wide um, path to the pond? Both, um, both actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Both actually. Right, that's what I said, yeah. and the two. And the cleared area ha can't be any closer than 25 feet from the water. Right, and we're, you know, that we're, we're saying we're good with that, but there shouldn't be any more 
uh, clear cutting in the buffer zone because that's the point of the buffer zone is to have this vegetative totally buffer right. that provides that's all exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, in, in that same area, though, for the upland zone, um, I think we're probably on the same page that you are in saying that um, maximum cleared area in the upland zone be limited to 40 percent of the 40 percent, but we just I think it needs to be made very clear that that's 40 percent of the upland zone itself. Yes. If that's the case, we're good. Yes. Okay. And, and again, you've, you've um, specifically enumerated that in your comments? It, it, I'm sorry. In, in yeah, your comments? Enumerated you, what I said okay, about what great. Gary, for. Thank you. I think it's, there's a copy there. Thank you. I sent you one in the mail too. But it's, no, no. no it's this, this right here, I think. Thanks. Um, just a couple more things. Um, won't make a lot of people in this room, or some people in this room, uh, happy, but we are, as others have done, proposing that there be a phase out of uh, mowing of lawn, um, <clears throat> except for the cleared areas we just talked about, the 100 square foot and the six foot path to the, to the lake. Um, that's, our, that's our proposal. Um, in, in which area? In the whole, the whole 250 feet? Uh, in the vegetated buffer, yeah. Well, the vegetated... Uh, there are brands... No, there's, there's no mowing in vegetated buffer anyway, right? Well, there are lawns that are mowing down there. to the pond. Yeah. But those are currently under current law, those are certainly legal. They have been legal. Under your provisions, they would remain legal. We're, we're with, with great humility, suggesting that they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, there, there are a, a number of other small points, but I, I will not um, try to cover them here. And I would hope that the Planning Commission would be able to review this. And if you have any questions or concerns or if we've made any mistakes, appreciate letting us know. And for the general public, uh, if there's not a copy and they seem to be gone, and you want one, we will be getting this on the website as soon as our incredibly talented uh, webmaster for the town. Um, <laughs> okay, I think I think I'm I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will be making these. We will be working with them. I so on this uh, conservation commission proposal, I think right now. You're allowed to develop a three acre lot in the shoreline with 300 feet of pond frontage, but you don't need road frontage. And then this is adding that you need 500 feet of road frontage. I also. saw that. I saw that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 that's a recommendation that they're making, and we have to look at it. I think we have 300 feet currently, right? On short, in Shoreland Road frontage, and the proposal would be 500? Not no. in our zoning, but in I think it's the distinction between the shoreland frontage and road frontage. Oh, I'm sorry. It's you know, right now, I don't think you need road frontage at all, as long as you have 300 feet of pond frontage. Well, no, in Shoreland District, it, the, your current Shoreland District requires a 300 foot minimum road. Right. Road and shore. And, and yes, I think and it's then either or. There's a 300. Um, da, 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 hang on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and your shoreland frontage is 300 foot. So th that's what you have currently. And I, uh, yeah. So unless you're not on the shoreline, then and you if you're not on the shoreland, and if you're in shoreland mm -hmm. district and you have no shoreland, it doesn't matter because I don't have 300 foot in my property, <laughs> and that's the that's the discrepancy that we see with having a district that's got three acres. And we're proposing to keep the 300 foot shoreline frontage if yes. you're on the shoreline. If you're on the shoreline, it's 300 feet. So that wouldn't change. That's not changing. Under the uh, Bill. Um, uh, as a rebuttal to what was said by the Conservation Commission, I, I think what, they, uh, what you, the Planning Commission has done is, is fair. 
I don't agree with some of it, but you know, life goes on. I think it's fair, and I would ask that it just be as easy to read as possible. I've dealt with the state with their shoreland stuff, found it very easy to navigate and understand and go out and figure it out myself. It seems sometimes, though, when it comes to the town, <laughs> one has to go kiss the ring. And it should not be that way. One should be able to figure it out for themselves and then ask for help. But to have hopes and dreams dashed, like what's happening up on Bainbridge Moldy Road, is something that we don't want to have happen. We want people to be able to figure it out and say, yeah, I can do it. No, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. and, and then ask for help and see what can be done. But, that's what I have to say. Okay, thanks. Jan, there, if, I, if I could, I apologize. There were two quick other points I wanted to make for you as well as the audience. Uh, on the um, maximum uh, impervious um, surface, mm -hmm. I believe the current regulations are at 10%, and I think your proposal mm -hmm. is to go to 20%, uh, mm -hmm. 20 and uh, our, uh, our, our point is, our view is that it should remain at the 10%. 10. Mm -hmm. um, and also, while we're on the question of things that are 10%, um, it's our proposal that um, within the Shoreland District, uh, that driveways or and development uh, not be uh, permitted on slopes greater than 10%. 10%? Yeah, that 14% <coughs> road that they put in, <coughs> next to the pond over on uh, Nelson Pond would be Exhibit A. I think the state's already had to go in there and do some work or the erosion that was occurring on that 14% grade apparently was, and, and I don't know this for a fact, John, but, but I'm, I'm told that, that uh, the erosion problems began. It was only a year ago that it was approved. So it's, it's the, the concern is, and I, and I I don't here in this document have sites to you know scientific support for that, um, but the concern is that um, land within the 250 feet or whatever it's going to be of the pond that have that have slopes greater than 10 percent shouldn't be um, developed um, because it's the runoff from those slopes that's one of the more significant things. Obviously, whether it's developed or not, and so the question is, how can you slow down that runoff on these streams? And the steeper the slope, the the, the more the runoff, I think, is a is a problem. That many there, there is some truth to that. There's also there's also the concept of how you put your driveway. You don't do it straight. You make a couple curves in the driveway, and you uh, put. Um, uh, what are some of the things in the driveway you could have rain gauges and yeah all those other kind of things so you know the idea of of saying you can't have something and these are the kinds of things that we do consider um, in terms of that so it's not just the degree of slope it's what you do when you're developing the driveway and that's also an educational thing I don't know but I mean I've got a driveway that does a lot of curving. So it, it, it's just all part of the discussion to, that, that we can have. That's similar to the question of mitigation, which is a broader concept that comes through it. When you read this document, you will find that the Conservation Commission is no big fan of the concept of mitigation. And what that means is you can get around the regulations by cutting a deal off. That's not so. Okay. Mitigation can also, by the way, help in Create uh, in, in in stopping erosion. Oh, absolutely. And so there there's an a po positive aspect of medi mitigation, and I just want to make sure that we know that there's a positive oh. aspect of mitigation, um, and it, and it's not all negative. <laughs> so would plant, would a conservation commission like to see the steep slope standard for the entire town ten percent? Uh, no, but why not? Kind of we kind of edged out of that. It is our recommendation that for the rest of the town it be 15 percent instead of 20. But only 10 percent in Shoreland. Because of, because of the, the the sensitivity of the bodies of water that are at the base of those slopes. Now what 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 nobody goes into is what happens if it's a slope going the other way, you know. But I won't get into into that. Well, someone's going to have to. 
Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm between the uh, North and the Kurt line. Um, you know, and I too would like to thank you guys for all the work you put in. Yeah. This isn't easy, you yeah. know, and there's no piece of land that, you know, fits any one of these rules, you know, perfectly. <laughs> and, and, and that is the hard part, I think, of, of this whole thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, it, it's getting to, to sound like, you know, I've got to go to the state, I've got to go to the town for every little thing that I might be doing on our piece of property. And it just seems like it's causing a burden, you know, on everybody. And the part that I don't like is that it may be creating, you know, like, I'm going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> and let them catch me later, because we're, we, there, there's going to be so many, so many rules. You know, or, it's not so many rules, but it's the same rules by different people. You know, and you have to get get an approval for this and, and that. But you know, so that's you know, and and I would like to point out, you know, instead of all these rules, it, uh, and I personally think mitigation is the way to go. I mean. There's a number of ways to, to fix any one thing. And, and if we're saying outlawing you know, everything to begin with, you know, it, it just makes it, uh, I, I don't know, it's just frustrating you know, for me as a land. A land. But uh, that's all. But I do appreciate all the hard work that you guys are doing. I, you know, because everybody wants to make sure the ponds and the rivers are, are good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Noreen Bryan, and I live on Curtis Pond. And I'm speaking tonight for the Callis Lakes and Streams Committee, which is a fairly informal group of people. But I guess hardest skin is into wanting to see these lakes and ponds and streams preserved for future generations. Um, and I guess we look at this from a point of view that we need to follow the science in deciding how best to protect these ponds. Many of us, I'm one of them, who have the luxury of living in the shoreland and living in a non-conforming structure right at the edge of the pond. And um, everything would tell us from science that that's really not good for ponds. And so, I think that the committee wants to make sure that we support regulations that do not allow people such as me to further <laughs> impair the lakes and ponds that we all love so much. And, and me too, I might add. <laughs> and all the, people, all of the members who are on this lakes and streams do live in non-conforming structures, <laughs> except for one, on the ponds, but we're also keenly aware that we're extraordinarily privileged. And because of that, or lucky, or whatever you want to say, but because of that, we feel, I guess the Lakes and Streams folks feel that we have a responsibility to be sure that we don't do any more harm, and if possible, protect against that. And so um, we support the provisions based on our best understanding of science that the Conservation Commission has brought forward for you to look at. Um, and, and I guess I'll just put a personal note. Having grown up on a pond in Connecticut and watching it completely disintegrate into a mass of algae my heart is in, we don't want that to happen here. And I, don't know, I know no one else does, but I think we need to be careful that we don't let it happen. And so I, I think those regulations are worthwhile. Well. And thank you. And I don't think we need to get bigger. We need to figure out how to do the right trade-off. Thank you. Okay, thank you. John. John Rosenblum. Um, I have, I have never been to it, but I think I'm about 500 foot or more frontage on what I call Curtis Swamp. Uh, which is not even on the map. Um, but somehow it misses the map, even though it's quite a bit, big location. Um, yeah, there it is, but not there. You see, it's always like, it looks like it's land, but about half of my parcel, which is what's coming off the bottom of Curtis Pond, or about a quarter of it, is swamp. My, my property line is right about the middle of the swamp. So, you went, is this it here? Is this your land? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I own. Um, but where do you go? Do you go? Does your land go to the? It goes end? to the road. Yeah. 
It goes to the road. Yes. And it goes to the culvert in that crosses Worcester Road from Curtis Swamp to, uh, okay. to Curtis Pond. So um, I swim in Curtis Pond, across Curtis Pond from the swimming area to the island about, I think, about 60, 60 mornings a year, restricted by weather. Um, I really, I'm really happy that I really want to praise the planning group to, 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 for the work you do. I know you're not, I don't think you're paid, and, and this is oh, the goodness of your heart. That's great. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful for the uh, Callis Conservation Commission and Lakes and Streams. Um, my understanding of Curtis Pond and the other ponds in Callis is that they are already being polluted more than they can handle. We've actually done more damage to them over the years through building right up close, through faulty septic systems, mm -hmm. through, it's already too much, right? So, so they're already, if you look at the area in Curtis Pond near the dam, the cove, it's called, officially called Corona Cove. When I came 20 years ago, you could swim right across and anywhere in that cove. Mm -hmm. Now it's just a water lily path. It's just the only, part that's open is what Don maintains with his, his uh, boat. Um, so that's what's happening. What we're doing to the Curtis Pond, what we're doing to all the other ponds in Calus, is we're destroying them through overdevelopment. We've already done that, and we can't take that back, and it doesn't make sense to, to, to say, okay, Noreen's got to take up her house and plant trees there or something. That's not going to happen, we know that. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to do more to these ponds. We don't want to hurt them more than we already have. They are going to die based on being loved to death, right? We're loving them to death. That's what we're doing, so let's just admit it. But let's slow it down as much as possible. And so I support the Callis Conservation Commission and, and their input into this, and I hope you take them seriously, and I hope you, you mm -hmm. think about our love for these ponds, that we are loving them to death. That's just sort of, you know, like a little kid squeezes a puppy until it can't breathe anymore. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Well, yeah. that's, that's a wonderful uh, and, that's uh, a wonderful So phrase. let's just keep that in mind and try to keep them alive for our future generations so that my children can swim across the pond, my grandchildren hopefully can swim across the pond. I don't think so. I think in a hundred years, Curtis Pond will be a lily pad place, you know, and there won't be swimming. So, so let's just see if we can keep it going 50 years more rather than 25 years more. So it's just it's like, this is for our children and for the future of Calus. This is our resource. And when we don't have Curtis Pond, and we don't have number 10 pond and, and adamant pond, we will have a lower economic value to our grand list and, and everything else. So, so, you know, I just think that we should love our, love our nature. You know, and not to death, maybe. <laughs> not as quickly. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad to see you uh, sort of halfway face to face. I have stood on the road and looked at your swamp and uh, admired it and been concerned about how the uh, drainage off of that cut that goes up toward uh, Worcester uh, drains right into that section. And for me, that was one of the pivotal um, observations that made me determine, as, as a member of this body, made me determine along with other people. I'm not, I'm not taking credit for it, but that was the thing, that visual input was the mm -hmm. thing that said to me loudest of anything that we can't let the shoreland regulations stop at the road. Yeah, good. <laughs> and it was your it was your swamp that made that so clear. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Colleen. Uh, Colleen, you the work on the Curtis Bond. To what you just said, uh, we a whole lot of us here have been doing loose strike and frag and uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story, but. We got uh, fish and game out. They came out in their busy schedule, the one man. And then they came out and then picked it up. That was great. But Mike Wachowski, who's also a Callis resident, and he's a baseball coach and all that. And there's a 
they put uh, 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 barbed wire as their edges. That's what fishing game does. And this barbed wire that we had been you know, stepping over, Norman said, we need to bring clippers because someone's going to get really hurt, is there. And when they put it in, it was four feet high. That's the sediment that came down at the fishing game. I mean, wow. to what you're saying, it was such a graphic. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a bar graph. It was, it was a, it was a fence that now is this high. That, that, I was Very blown away by that. And that it proceeded into the pond. Of course, that's just what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you for everything. Um, our next meeting and planning is uh, October 4th. Um, we will certainly uh, review the Conservation Commission's documentation. We've had the documentation from Noreen. Um, we've had a lot of, um, even before this meeting, uh, reviews. And, and so we do have some um, issues that we're reviewing. Um, there will be changes, I'm sure. And um, being humans, we don't always do things right the first time. I mean, that's all part of learning, and that's all part of living. Um, so um, there will be changes. You will get notified when the changes are made. Uh, there will be a report that has to go with the changes, that documents uh, what the changes are. And this will be printed out before it goes to the select board, um, but that will be the next time you'll probably have another public hearing will be the select board's hearing. Um, and I think that's the way the process is that we're directed to do. Jan, on, on that point, I remember that at, a, at a meeting not long ago, you were talking in general terms about, about the time frames for this, and you've mentioned some of them, but my specific point is now, uh, at, that, at that time, you seem to indicate that you thought probably this revised draft that you would be in the process of making now uh, would probably need to be done around the middle of October so that it could get to the... It's not good. We, yeah. Um, I have a personal goal, but that's... I think um, we know we probably aren't going to make the March date that I wanted. Um, I'm sorry, please. I said we are probably not going to make the March date that we wanted. Um, I look at the select board's <laughs> agenda. We aren't even on it at all. I have warned the select board three times that planning commission is working through this, but if they don't get it onto their agenda, it isn't going to be done this year. I mean, I, and it's, I, I, have, a, I have a reality uh, check on this. It's, it's not what I like. Um, but I also want to say is we want to do it right. Uh, and if it takes us until the middle of November to get the final draft, then that's the way it's going to be. We're not, you know, I, I just have to get off of my own personal agenda. Um, uh, and I have a personal agenda for a variety of reasons. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, that's. So don't worry, we, we will try to do it the right way, and, and if we, I don't know if we can do a, I don't know if we can pay for a special vote in June, but anyway, if it has to go to next November, so it does, you know. But this is great, getting everybody's input. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been at it for years, some of you were at some of the earlier public right, meetings right. about certain sections of it, so, right. so really appreciate it. Thank you, and with that, I guess we'll say that this public hearing is over. <laughs> <laughs>